For more information on how we can help with OSINT training and development, go to janes.com forward slash OSINT training. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Janes World of Intelligence podcast. I'm Terry Patter. I lead the Janes Intelligence Unit. And in this episode, I'm joined by my colleague, Mark Wilson, and by Judy King, Editorial Director at BBC Monitoring. Thanks for joining us. It's great to have some of your time and to get your input on this podcast. It's a pleasure. So within this series of podcasts, we're essentially talking to a variety of different guests and and other members of our team and colleagues about things that are relevant to the world of open source intelligence. But really, it's in general how we get information and how we go about finding out what's going on in in the world around us. And so it's great to have somebody from BBC Monitoring because it's so synonymous with trying to understand what's happening in the world at large. And It'd be great to get your thoughts and views on on how that's developing and some of the trends you're seeing, some of the challenges as well in how the information environment is shifting in different places. But just to start off with, it'd be great to get a bit more of an introduction from yourself in terms of some of your background. How, how did you get into working for BBC Monitoring and sort of what your role currently involves? Sure. Yeah. So, well, firstly, thanks very much indeed for having me on. It's great to be a part of this. So, I started to work at BBC Monitoring, I'm really showing my age now, in November 1999, and I'd finished my degree in um, French and German, lived in Japan for a couple of years teaching English, and then, you know, was looking to come back to the UK and saw job advertised at BBC Monitoring as an East Asia researcher, and so that's where I started, and at the time, I was updating index cards on a typewriter. That really makes me sound old. Um, and we were changing our North Korean transliteration system. So that takes me back. Um, but since then, I moved from the research team into the journalistic team on the Asia Pacific desk and then moved into our central news writing hub. I spent a little bit of time at News Online working there on the Africa desk, actually. And then came back to monitoring, moved into more news management, and then spent some time in various different change programs and learned a lot, actually, about the kind of interaction between technology and journalists and how important technology is in covering open source media. And a few years ago, we moved from our base um, that was in Cavisham Park. We moved into London, heart of BBC News, and a new role was created at that point, Innovation Director. Quite a grand title, sounds a little bit like Head of Better for those uh, fans of W1A. Um, But I really love that role. Um, Really the opportunity to kind of collaborate with people within the BBC, looking at this sort of language technology, collaborating a lot with people outside um, the BBC on different projects, and then working obviously with our journalists to really embed change into the workflow. So I did that job for a couple of years and then More recently, um, less than a year ago now, I took on the role of editorial director, which was kind of heading up our editorial department based both in a new broadcasting house in London, but 13 offices around the world, about 200 journalists. But I still have that innovation spirit in me. So trying to kind of make sure that whatever we do and whatever new challenges arise, we're totally looking forward to kind of improving the service we provide to all our, our different users, if you like. Just for those out there who aren't maybe familiar with what BBC Monitoring does, what is BBC Monitoring and how does it relate to the rest of the BBC? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so we're, we're a very small part of the BBC. Unlike, I think, the rest of the BBC, we're, we're not audience facing, although you will see more and more um, some of my colleagues um, on BBC News outlets. We're part of World Service Group, but we are more of a B2B service. We have customers in the UK government and commercial organisations as well, as well, of course, as feeding our input into BBC News, into the journalism. Um, and what we do is we understand and report on what the media around the world is saying. Yeah, thanks for describing BBC Monitoring. It's, it's a really interesting organisation, I think. And in terms of certainly our audience, I know a lot of our customers also, as well as using Jane's, use BBC Monitoring for their general news and awareness of what's going on around the world. Um, in the time that you've been involved in the organisation, what have been some of the big changes that you've seen perhaps in the way that BBC Monitoring is sort of looking outwards and, and trying to get information in and, and find out what's going on in different places? Yeah, I mean, the, obviously the media environment has just changed beyond recognition in the 20 years that I've worked at BBC Monitoring. When I started in the in the Asia Pacific desk, we were very much, I was focusing on Chinese state-run media. We weren't really talking about social media. 
we actually referred to it at the time as NEM, New and Emerging Media. That was the kind of term we gave to social media at the time. And, and, and of course, now our teams are, are constantly hopping from one platform to another, um, whether it be, well, I mean, in Russia, TV still remains really significant. But now we've been reporting on how Telegram is becoming um, kind of unblocked in the country. Um, talking about our jihadist media team, how when jihadist accounts went um, from Twitter, then to Telegram and now onto more niche platforms, Rocket Chat and many others. And so the the way in which, you know, previously we were really had we were able to kind of structure the work around broadcast commitments, really. And now we need a much more fluid, agile approach to our coverage and as new platforms arise, we have to be kind of flexible to build those quickly into the workflow. Um, it ran another really in- interesting example. Again, TV important, newspapers often freer than broadcast outlets to report on what's going on in the situation there. And then the complexity of social media in Iran and trying to find um, and distinguish between what's coming from on the ground versus um, uh, people outside the country. So it's a whole a much, much more complex web um, to tell the stories that, that our customers and our users are looking to us to tell. The Jane's Intelligence Unit will be launching a new online open source intelligence masterclass on Monday, the 13th of July, 2020. A modular progressive self-study course, the Jane's Masterclass enables you to learn the same open source intelligence techniques and tradecraft used by Jane's analysts at your own pace, wherever you are. Make sure to visit janes.com forward slash OSINT Masterclass on the 13th of July for more information or drop an email to inquiries at janes.com with online OSINT training in the subject line. Yeah, it sounds... um really really complex uh, world just keeping across all those sources i mean one one challenge is, is as you've already identified Judy, isn't it it's the keeping across the different platforms and then um for bbc launching as well keeping across so many different languages as well mm-hmm. i mean how how do you guys um keep across so many sources in so many different languages well, we have some very talented people i'll say that first up um we have people. I've already mentioned immersed in those environments. So they speak the language, they're immersed in the language, they understand the nuance and they can then, they frequently speak multiple languages as well, which is essential for our work. We also, in addition to the journalists um, who work for the BBC, we have networks of independent contractors who we call on for um, specific projects too. And then of course we use technology to support them. Um, and I think at the moment it's that way round. It's um, journalists turbocharged by the technology rather than the other way round, technology trained by journalists. But, you know, it's interesting balance, actually. And I think as time evolves, you know, that may shift too. I mean, it'd be, you know, as you try to keep across this ever growing um, mass of media. And of course, it's not just keeping across of it, across it. It's making sense of it and how we can free up journalists um, to have time to make sense of it, not just um, keep going and, and, and translate or transcribe. And one thing we've done recently, I mean, in addition to, um, you know, freely av- available social analytics tools, we've um, we've worked with development teams within the BBC and, and some external partners to create a tool which transcribes TV sources into the vernacular. Um, and it's quite a simple tool in a way. It just get, you know, you feed in the, the TV source and you get a, a transcript. Um, it's not perfect as you'd expect and some languages are better than others. But what's fantastic about it is it just frees up journalists because instead of having just to sit there with their headphones on watching, watching, nothing interesting. Oh, yes, that's interesting. I'll, I'll write about that. They're able just to skim through um, and find those really interesting things. Um, and previously, we pretty much had to limit our broadcast monitoring to news programming because, 
you know, there's only, only so many hours in the day. Um, but now we're able to keep across talk shows as well, which in many countries are very significant and of great interest to our users, you know, what's being discussed in those talk shows. And many of them go on late into the night, especially in countries like Russia, um, you know, Egypt, Brazil, you know, um, and it's really hard to you know, structure a rotor around, around doing that sort of work. But this technology has, has unleashed a bit of that. So we are looking constantly at how we can use um, AI, other technology to kind of, you know, turbocharge our journalists, if you like. That's really interesting. I mean, and then how do you though decide in terms of being editorial director, how do you decide priorities in terms of, you know, what people should cover or what do you report? Because you can't, you can't report everything from a particular country how do you decide you know and is it is it down to the individual or the individuals covering that country to decide or do you sort of give them guidelines or direction yeah. how, what's the process there yeah so we have um i think one yeah we have a, a really strong group of editorial leads the te- the the people that lead the, our different regional teams and we have weekly meetings with those and our BD team who are closely talking to customers. We try and interpret as closely as we can. Of course, we have a wide customer set, so they have a wide range of interests, but there are sweet spots and there are areas that we know, you know, uh, disinformation is of interest to pretty much everybody, Um, you know, security issues, and then, you know, geopolitics more broadly. in some ways as well, it's interesting, you know, some societal issues are becoming of more interest to our users than perhaps they were before and um, how societies are changing. Um, so we have lots of discussions um, with these editorial leads who then guide their teams as to what to select. Um, but it's um, we produce about between 500 and 600 different pieces of content a day. So it's oh. quite hard to get your arms around all of it, yeah. um, and it, which is quite um, an interesting place to be as editorial director, uh, because it's not like you can read everything. Mm. Um, so it's, yeah, those editorial leads, the assistant editors who work closely as well, and, you know, having that kind of constant feedback loop uh, about, you know, what's working for our users, what we should focus more on. You mentioned there, Judy, uh, that word disinformation. Um, and of course, that's been such a big story in itself in, in recent years, hasn't it? Um, so how does BBC Monitoring go about detecting fake news? And what what are you finding to be the main challenges in that process? Yeah, that's a good. Very, very yeah, important question at the moment, that's for sure. So as um, I don't if I mentioned earlier, but monitoring was set up in the Second World War, about 80, we celebrated our 80th anniversary last year. And, and in a way, we were set up to monitor fake news even before anyone even used the term. And it's been something that's been kind of a constant feature of the work of monitoring for many years. However, a couple of years ago, we really stepped that up to a different level and we set up a, um, a bespoke disinfo unit within um, within monitoring. And what that's enabled us to do is really focus our coverage of this area. And so I think it's a very small team, but I think they tackle this issue in two main different ways is one collaboration. So they work closely with our regional teams, um, looking at what sort of disinformation is coming out of the different media environments, because it is different in different places. Different things take off in different areas. And it's interesting then they can then take a more global view of what's then popping up um, elsewhere so that's that's one thing that just a journalistic collaboration they also work closely with the other teams within the bbc who are doing this work so you may come have seen um, reality check bbc mm-hmm. trending they're all in that same space um, so they're able to share tips and tricks around different tools available and that brings me to the second um, way in which they do it is through use of social analytics tools plus kind of free video um, research, image manipulation tools, ones that can spot um, um, and help with that verification effort. So I think it's those two things, that collaboration, spotting trends as they emerge on the ground, and then to the use of technology. And that team also works closely with 
the BBC's R&D teams who are looking into issues such as um, deep fakes, um, um, what's being, um, what's coming, you know, what we're seeing in terms of how deep fakes are evolving and becoming more sophisticated and then how we can use technology to spot them. So that's kind of how we do it. Definitely not a precise and exact science, but these guys, again, this has been the beauty of having this this specialised team is they're absolutely immersed in it. Um, so through that, they're kind of finding their way through the key stories. And I think the biggest challenge is just the volume, sheer volume of material coming through. And of course, to kind of unpick through this very kind of just like treacle, you know, trying to find your way through it. Rarely is it just a straight fake. Um, and often it's much more complex web of kind of half truths and it takes a lot of research and a lot of verification. And so the biggest challenge the team have and um, Rebecca, who heads up that team, is just deciding where should we focus our efforts, you know, and, and making sure that's of most use um, for all our different users. So, yeah, that, that's the situation with disinformation. It's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a big challenge for everybody. I think it's something, you know, there's such a rapid pace and, and a huge volume of information that's coming out. And in many ways, it's the volume that's, that's the challenge because, you know, as those stories spread and as they become, you know, seen by more people, it's harder and harder to push back on them and it's harder and harder to disprove them or debunk them and, and get people to accept that. And I think that's where organizations seem to be really struggling is just getting ahead of it or stopping it or coming out with things to refute these sort of fake stories etc or, or these things that are deliberately designed to mislead but that's i guess that's always been the case i don't think that's ever probably changed since bbc monitoring began it's Absolutely. probably always been part of the challenge so yeah. i guess now it's just a, a volume and speed issue more than anything yeah um, and of course the impact it can have you know with social media on everybody's phone um it's yeah it's just taking it to a completely different level um which is why organization governments are so keen um to, have to find you know a way through it which you know us and many other organizations are kind of feeding in to help support that so yeah real challenge of our era i think yeah and you mentioned that sort of r&d and the use of technology etc is it, is it getting, getting us there is it getting us closer to where we need to get and you know will it will we see a big difference in the way that we deal with disinformation do you think or is it is it still going to be a long time before those sorts of tools are ready to really help i think there's no silver bullet i think that's clear i think there's a fine balance to be struck because as you do more research into deep fake you then make it easier to create them as that information comes you know, the more research you do into combating it, that technology then becomes more kind of openly available. And then, you know, there is a risk that that creates a, a bigger issue in itself. But I mean, there's no there's no way around it that you, we have to find a way to do this. Um, and, and I think what's interesting, just to talk a little bit more about the, the deep fake side of thing is um, because everyone's aware of the potential you know, absolutely catastrophic danger of, of something like this. Of, um, we, we aren't seeing really any evidence of this being used for real. Mm-hmm. Um, but it only takes one. <laughs> it's the fear of it, I think, within mm. and, and it only takes someone on Twitter to say, oh, that video on YouTube, I think that's, that's a fake, that's a deep fake. And then that, you know, all your journalistic instincts are kind of then thrown off, you know, and really experienced editors are like, oh, my goodness, is this fake? Is this true? And how do you convey that nuance to an audience? It's really challenging. Um, and I don't think technology alone will ever be the answer. I think it will. It has to be. You know, we have to invest in this technology. We have to be at the forefront, if you like, but also collaboration with others in this field a common language sharing, you know, mm. media literacy. I think it's all part of the jigsaw, really. Mm. But there are a lot of people now working on this, collaborating on this. So you do have to have hope. But I don't think that technology alone mm. will solve it. Mm. In fact, sure. probably going to create. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting with technology, isn't it? Technology is probably both the solution and the problem. And it's you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. finding balance. Yeah. One of the areas we talk about in our team quite a lot isn't it Terry is the the world of open source information and this kind of idea of, it, of there being a golden age of open source information over the last 
last few years, you know, um, for open well, source researchers. Yeah, but I think specifically with that, you know, as Judy mentioned, that growth of social media and yeah. um, in many ways it's caused problems in terms of, oh, how do you get on top of it? How do you cover it? But at the same time, I think from our perspective, or certainly some of our audience, the way they've perceived it is that, you know, you're getting so much more detailed, richer information about what's happening in various parts of the world that you weren't getting before necessarily. And so I think that has been what we've called this golden age of open source information. And then now with social media platforms restricting users and or restricting access to information, I suppose, um, we're seeing that age come to an end. It's, it's partly how we're starting to see things going. And I, I mean, yeah, sorry, carry on, Mark. I mean, you were sort of getting into talking about that and you know, no, I mean, to touch on a little bit about that concept and how we came to it. Yeah, I mean, the question really, Julie, I mean, are you seeing similar things? And, and in terms of the future of open source information, do you see do you see that kind of reducing or do you see there being more opportunities to, for collecting open source information going forward? Mm. It was interesting to hear you describe it in those terms, actually. I, I hadn't heard it described like that, but it's certainly, yeah, certainly food for thought. So slightly thinking on my feet here. I mean, what we aren't seeing at the moment is a drop off of sources. I think in the world of jihadist propaganda and jihadist media, that's probably a separate case where the main platforms are clamping down and the groups are now going on to more niche platforms. I mentioned Rocket Chat earlier, Hoop, there are many others. And that poses a challenge on how to kind of keep the sources, you know, keep on top of them, keep track of them. But when we're talking about broadly events on the ground, people reporting, we are constantly following new Facebook groups, new people on Twitter. I mean, the situation in Libya, for example, just to pick up on that, I mean, it is just such a complex situation there, different countries involved. But the sense you get from videos on the ground through Facebook pages is just incredible compared to perhaps what we would have got in years gone by. So we're not so much seeing that tail off, but in, interesting. I, I do know what you mean. It will be really interesting to see how it kind of evolves. I think also, I mean, maybe I'm going to sound really old fashioned here, but TV in many countries is still a hugely powerful medium. And I think what we try to do at monitoring is look at the media landscape as a whole and try not to, I mean, obviously the tools and techniques we use to monitor TV versus press versus social are very different, but we do try to encourage um, the view of the media landscape as a whole because I think that's where we really get under the skin of what's going on in a place. So as media shifts from one thing to another, we're still kind of covering the bigger picture. But anyway, it'd be interesting to see. Maybe you could invite me back on and we'll talk about how the golden age ended. Yeah, great idea. <laughs> yeah, it's a good topic, definitely. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's interesting. You, you talked about new and emerging media when it, we sort of first came across social media, really, I suppose. And, and yeah. I thought it, it took me back immediately to when we first started delivering open source intelligence training. And we used to even then, and this is in sort of 2008, 2009, even then we used to refer to it as new and social media. And because it, it was new, and <laughs> you know, and it's <laughs> this new thing. This new thing. <laughs> and it's it's not new anymore. But it's interesting how you describe the, especially in the case of Libya, say, getting still good quality information and finding out what's going on on the ground using videos posted on Facebook. How have things developed in terms of, say, some of the local news outlets that you maybe previously used, not just sort of the broadcast news, but maybe newspapers, etc. I mean, I think journalism as a whole has been going through a sort of global yeah. crunch in terms of, you know, it's getting harder and harder for newspapers to operate and stay profitable and journalists to stay employed. Has that had a knock on effect for BBC monitoring in terms of there either being fewer local news outlets to get information from or to review versus in some places, have they also, have, have the quality of some of those outlets reduced? Mm, really, really interesting. Yeah, I mean, media outlets have for some time been having a very difficult time and we're seeing that just ramp up now in the COVID-19 era. Um, we we're just reporting the other day of Turkish newspapers stopping publication for four days, you know, hasn't been seen for 20 odd years and they just stopped because they had no advertising, no one to distribute them. And that's, you know, these are big names. These are not actually the small local papers that you're talking about. So, yeah, 
I mean, how that all pans out as, as you know, we, we kind of move into the, you know, post COVID-19 era will be, you know, very interesting to follow. I think in terms of for monitoring specifically, I think it completely depends on the region. I think for some areas for a long time, we've used the social media accounts of activists or people on the ground and not really media organisations to cover um, developments, but also feeding in, of course, again, state run media in many countries still a significant player. And so getting that balance of the two, I think in other regions, we do a lot in West Africa, radio still important still you know where we get the bulk of our information from Mali for example so we do take it you know region by region I think it's going to be really interesting as uh, in the coming year to see how how that then you know evolves. Just talking about taking it region by region one of the things that I always reminded of BBC monitoring when I check out the BBC website and I see the news from elsewhere blog um which you could explain better than, than I can Judy but um some of the stories on that are just they're just so interesting to read especially some of the ones you guys have produced on the unusual world of North Korea I just think that's that's a great example of what BBC monitoring does it kind of digs out those little nuggets of information that maybe the majority of folks wouldn't find within countries that maybe have obscure media environments uh, it's interesting you should mention uh, news from elsewhere. It's a small strand of what we do, actually. It's quite different from the kind of core, quite serious world of, you know, civil wars or terrorist attacks, which is kind of normally our bread and butter, whereas news from elsewhere, slightly lighter touch, um, but still interesting insight, I think, into the societies in which this media um, is, is kind of being broadcast. We do do stories about North Korea, Turkmenistan, also very interesting stories coming out of there. It's been interesting as well, um, our news from elsewhere segment in this coronavirus era, actually, because it's really interesting to hear how different countries are using their media to, I suppose, help the people kind of get through it, really. We, we did have an interesting story the other day of um, a Swedish local council using their, so that's pretty local, uh, using their Twitter account to tell people about the least visited tourist spots in their area so people can visit them whilst ensuring social distancing. So it's things like a nuclear power station's car park rarely visited <laughs> only two visitors in the last two years things like that so it's, it is much more the kind of lighter side but still interesting um for people to see yeah, yeah I mean, one of the things i always one of the stories from that blog that always stands out for me is when north korea launched a um a mobile mobile game like a video game on yes. um the portuguese football player cristiano ronaldo um <laughs> So really random stuff like that, but just gives you a little bit of a, it's an insight. Kind of what of what it, it, yeah, it's what makes the world go round, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> in, in terms of those, you know, trying to surface little nuggets, and, and I think it's, a lot of it comes down to being able to contextualise information, doesn't it? And that's where, you, you know, you guys have got, as you said, you've got really, really talented colleagues. You've got the expertise in-house to be able to say perhaps what is significant or what is important about this story in the context of that country. And so do you, do you find that sometimes you get a very different view being within BBC monitoring of what's going on in different countries versus if you were just a normal, and I know it's probably hard to separate, but if you were just a normal consumer of information using mainstream news outlets, I suppose, um, did you get to really see behind what is the maybe the top level news and, and dig deeper and, and find out what's going on in different places? Yes, abs- absolutely. And I think it's it's the level of granularity. I mean, this is what monitoring does every day, regardless of what's happening in a country. We are watching their media and we're telling our users about what's going on there. So that's quite a different experience. Usually news covers when something's happening or when something's really just about to happen. So I suppose the value for monitoring is we're able to notice when things are changing, even if gradually, even if small signs and tell people about that. So that horizon scanning, flagging up stories before they become stories, if if you like, and information before before it becomes big news. I suppose that's the key difference. Um, and I suppose one of the big changes that monitoring currently kind of embarking in is what 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 interests you know previously um 
we translated a lot of material and we did a lot of individual reports and we expected our users to kind of, you know, go through them <laughs> uh, and read them all uh, and, and then, you know, make their own conclusions as to what's important and what's not. And I suppose more and more we're hearing from our users that they just you know, there's so much information that they want us to help. They still want that granularity. There's no change from that. They still want to be reassured that we are watching every day. Um, we're not just kind of following the news when it breaks. Um, but they want us, they want our journalists, our experts to kind of flag up, why does this matter? What's the context here that makes this a significant thing and worth taking note of? So that's, you know, part of the work that we're doing to look at our product mix and, and, and make sure it's, you know, absolutely the most useful for the people who use our service. I, th I think, um, yeah, I mean, one area of it, isn't it, Julie, is obviously you guys cover the stories, you, you cover the developments on the ground and, and um, you, know, you cover the stories be before they come stories is, is what you just described. I guess another Another useful output maybe of having uh, media specialists in BBCM cover specific regions or countries is that you guys can also cover the actual media environments within countries and you understand uh, potential biases within um, media sources or media organisations, which someone maybe doesn't have m much knowledge about that region or country, just, just accesses a news report and takes it for face value perhaps. Whereas, I guess, if you've got a team analyst who really kind of dug in inside a country, inside that media environment, they can tell you, I guess, well, these sources have this particular slant and these sources have another particular slant. I guess that's something that you guys cover. I mean, it's so... Doing. Uh, that's, yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that, Mark, because actually that's at the heart of the value that monitoring can bring. Really, it's not just about the information. It's about the source of that information and then helping people to interpret that accordingly. So I suppose the way I always, when people are new to monitoring and, and we, you know, and, and they, they if, particularly if they're like me, they're um, born and brought up in the UK, I think we know, um, you know, about the different slants of different UK news uh, outlets yeah. And, um, you know, so if you're reading something in the Financial Times and you're reading something in, say, the Mirror, you might, you know, you might know the different journalists who, who you know, and their sources. And you can then judge, you know, where to put the emphasis, really, in the information. And I suppose what our customers are coming to us for is they might know that for the UK. They might know, you know, how to judge information from different types of sources, which, of course, there are plenty in the UK and they're rich and varied. So I suppose what's interesting, though, is they don't know that for Tunisia. So they don't know this radio, this online blog, you know, what's their leaning, what's their slant, you know, what, what are their sources. That's what they're coming to us for because they think we do know and, and, um, and we do. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, is it getting harder, though, in many ways to keep track of that i mean are they in 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 several of the, of the countries around the world or in regions are you finding that there's bigger changes occurring in terms of the slants that different outlets might have or is it is it staying fairly consistent you know once you once you get to know a media environment and a particular country does it does it stay the same for a, for a while or is it is it like here where sometimes you know a newspaper might throw its weight behind the government and other times it might not do yes I, know, I don't think i would ever use it the word consistent i think right. i think i think it definitely it's it, most of the environments that we're covering bar say maybe i think it depends by region i'm just right. thinking uh, i think you're allowed really like <laughs> sure. central asia i think possibly fairly stable the middle east definitely not stable but i think there is a range there i think when it comes to like sources changing their stance i think it's rarely subtle i'm, I'm right. going out on a limb here i think we do spot that quite easily quite readily because i suppose there's a reason why they're doing it and that's the kind of thing people are looking to us to explain but it is something we do track and basically we do our level best to understand mm. what the source's stance is because that helps our users interpret the information that they're conveying so you know we produce annual media environment guides which track these changes so we do put quite a lot of resource into doing that so not only telling the stories of the day but also explaining the media environment 
we've recently introduced a, a kind of um, the meter environment guides are often you know thousands and thousands of words long um, and we're now introducing a kind of media snapshot so we can bit more fleet of foot when things change uh, we can more quickly it's often what people come to us for when a crisis breaks actually that's really interesting so i think that's something we've seen certainly is that in some of the countries we're interested in sometimes information isn't as objective as perhaps it used to be or there's more political polarization um yeah. rather than more even or balanced coverage or attempts at balanced coverage i suppose um so yeah it's it's in some ways getting getting harder and this, this sort of loops back to what we were saying about the maybe the end of the the golden age of, of some of the information we look at but you know it's getting harder in some ways to know what's going on in places but in other ways um as you've described there's still plenty of information and it's not so much or often understanding what what's happening but more the context of it and explaining it to people that's the challenge yeah it's much more complicated i suppose at monitoring we've always actively seeked out this polarized media um because the areas where we are really focused russia the middle east um uh, iran afghanistan yeah we really want to understand you know what people are being told in those areas and then what opposition sources are saying to counter that so i think our key thing is um explaining the source that's the key thing rather than trying to find an unbiased source in a particular region because as you said sometimes you'll you'll spend a lot of time looking for yeah yeah indeed yeah that's true So Judy what's um what does the immediate future have in hold for BBCM or looking at the year ahead have you any exciting projects in the mix Oh all sorts of exciting projects Mark as you'd expect um and I've kind of touched on them a bit already you know looking to how we can make sure that through our our different means our different products we can deliver this insight and context to our users at the same time as the granular you know day by day reporting how we can bring that bring that to the full more we're looking a lot at how we describe sources how we can make that as clear as possible to our users looking to see can we um can we come up with a kind of um a consistent way of describing that across our different regions because we're talking about quite different media environments so we we want to have that same consistent approach wherever possible so that that that's exciting uh, for us <laughs> in in the in the world of open source monitoring um Yeah. What are the sort of big challenges that you can see Judy in terms of trying to do that do all of that and trying to maintain coverage of different yeah. places, you know. It's it's just time, time. resource mm. um because uh it's very in order for our journalists to be able to explain you know how how it's going to impact things in the future they need time to not only be immersed in that but to think about that and then if we're expecting them to do the day by day reporting too is just coming up with how can technology help with that so that's you know a key thing um um to do that mm-hmm. and then is it well i guess you've got the added challenge of as you were saying earlier about trying to go more from giving the information to people but trying to give them more of the so what and explaining yeah. a little bit about what it means for them yeah. that in itself takes time as well of course it does and um i suppose if you're doing just a, a translation of something broadcast on Syrian TV well we will have someone you know checking that translation for accuracy that's you know relatively easy to do but if we you know the editorial discussions that need to happen about what's significant what a certain narrative means versus another you know the value then is that editorial discussion for people who are also immersed in that environment to check to challenge um you know of course all that's hugely important to us you know we're bbc journalists you know that's you know we have to have these editorial checks and balances very time consuming and 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 um but you know we have to find a way to to achieve that one last question for me really which was just looping back to what you're saying about the a uh, technology and innovation piece and thinking in terms of the more automation that's available now and especially when you're trying to deal with so many different languages um and and you, and you said translations can vary in quality and with some languages it's easier than others um it, there's there's never a, you, could you ever env- envisage a point where you think actually the need for having 
sort of linguist is going to be reduced? I know this is probably going to be a difficult question given, you know, from BBC Monitoring's perspective, you're probably very, um, very much opposed to that because, you know, that's, that's sort of what the, uh, the, the organization is founded upon really is its linguistic capabilities and being able to sort of translate content and understand what's going on in different places. But for organizations where they don't have that sort of level of talent that you've got surrounding you, is it going to become easier for them to be able to get on top of information from different countries? Or do you think they're always going to need at some point to turn to linguists who've got the right skills and the right expertise to be able to really explain what's happening in different parts of the world? So we've been working for a long time in monitoring together with um, colleagues uh, across the BBC who deal with language technology to kind of understand where, you know, where it's at and the improvements in the last three years in terms of not only transcription but also translation is just incredible it's just night and day from where it was previously that doesn't make me concerned about the future of monitoring however because it's about the media environment and how that's used and linguistic expertise will always be a key part of what we look for in monitoring because I don't think you can understand a media environment um, and how it works without that immersion in it. But I think what we will see is a move away from translation itself as being the end product, um, which was you know, previously that was the case. It was those beautifully translated, hand translated pieces. And I think more and more we we do do some uh, just straight translation, but they offer speeches where they really, you know, where the words, the precision really matters. Whereas more and more we're moving to still linking to the source material, following that granular coverage day in, day out. But really leading on the so what why does this matter why is this significant so yeah I I think without that without that media knowledge I think it's hard to do the job we're doing Mm. even with some of the amazing technology (laughs) yeah it's really really interesting and uh, you know that I I wanted to raise that point because that's the question we get quite often from some of our customers is uh, you know when we deliver training to them how can they get on top of um, foreign language content on especially online Um, is there are there automated tools to help them do that and uh, you know one of the points I always make to people is you know even if those tools get to a point where they are very very good and you know you can really rely on them for giving you maybe word for word translations still being able to place them in context and like you said understand the so what and what it means for for um that country is not something you can do unless you know a lot about unless you've got the subject matter expertise unless you you know you're you've got the language capability as well um and uh, yeah i think that's that's always likely to be to be the case so great stuff um well thanks so much for joining us on this podcast it's been really great to get your thoughts and insight into how bbc monitoring does what it does so thanks for joining us well thank you very much for having me thanks you And for more information on how we can help with OSINT training and development, go to janes.com forward slash OSINT training.